and we really do need to pull together because the world is going at a kind of a, in a crazy way. I've got to love it for the Kiwis this morning. It's going fantastically. You know, it's like I'm here. Pip's a Kiwi. She's from Palmerston North, which is the only city in New Zealand worse than the city I'm from, called Hamilton. <laughs> <laughs> Redifies here, started by a Kiwi. Like fantastic, and do come over because we are. I do have. It's a bit sneaky, but. Um, a very lucky human being to have a Microsoft HoloLens, which I love sharing. And, and if you want to have a go on that and shoot some robots, you might even want to look at the software memo around housing. Uh, come over to the corner. I've also got this, which is a representation of where technology is at today and some of the challenges you're going to have to think about. Because this, believe it or not, is a guy working really hard. <laughs> so this is Matt. He is a UX developer with us, and he is working on our uh, VR team to try and make house tours and their entire realestate.com.au portal work inside a 360 environment. How many textbooks do you reckon there are today from O'Reilly or whoever on how to design within a 3D environment best UX practices? That'll be none. And this is what I want to get to, is getting, talking about your ability to use that curiosity and talent to invent for this kind of world, because he is actually working incredibly hard there. Particularly, this is the only technology I've ever worked with where I've actually sent in consumer testing a customer to hospital with a, a neck injury and somebody has vomited in waste basket. <laughs> Not an easy technology to work with. But that's the challenge of the world we kind of live in today. You know, you don't get many manuals with these kind of things. So, you're lucky, we're like Microsoft. I mean, Jesus, it's not your dad's Microsoft, is it? When they're producing shit like that. <laughs> this goes through it. Um, I often give this talk to all, all sorts of people. Some things I don't have to explain today, but this is my title. Beginner's Guide to Shit That's Hard to Explain About Your Job. And it's only going to get worse. I don't want to leave you at the end with a sense of what I think your job is, which is rich for an economist telling engineers on a Saturday morning. <laughs> Mars. Mars is really important. I show this to real estate agents, they go, oh, look, seven one-bedroom units. <laughs> Fuck off, they're studios, they're not one-bedroom units. <laughs> Love them dearly. But someone will need to start a real estate agency on Mars. And maybe it isn't Elon Musk, because he won't own everything on Mars at that point. But I brought Mars up as a, as a conversational piece for anybody in society today, because what Mars is about is this crazy moment. A political scientist on television interviewing Elon Musk about what the political system will be on Mars. Now, the world's changed, hasn't it? Asking a nerd what the political system on Mars is going to be. Because we all laugh. We all call him Emperor Musk, don't we? Holy shit, what if that's true? He favours a benevolent dictatorship. Because democracy, I mean, who's democracy? New Zealand's democracy where it's mixed member proportional representation and nothing gets done? Australian democracy with two houses with nobody we like in the upper house. American democracy, which you buy. I don't know who, and it, like, who has the rights to decide. And what it is, it's about a world where the rules are off. And this is an interesting thing to me because there are people all around Australia who are having the same thought. What if the rules were off around property? What if the rules were off around jobs, around science, you know, all the things we know and go to work every day with as our mindset, they disappear on Mars. Now, we thought Mars is going to get a million people to Mars. That's a pretty impressive kind of a, a, a claim. We have 120 staff in China. Tell you what, in Xi'an in China, you couldn't see the other side of the street in the middle of summer. The atmosphere there looks quite good in comparison. <laughs> $600,000 to get there, it's 262 days. They're going to have the first people there in the next four years. It's just mind-boggling as a thought, because that's a one-way ticket. Then they go, no, hold on a minute. My granddad came to Australia in 1928 on a boat. Took him six months to get here. I'll tell you what, the spaceship to Mars is going to be a lot classier than the boat he came out on. Off to, had to go all the way across to South America, Cape Town, Perth, oh, Perth, Jesus, third world. <laughs> when he landed, it looked like that. <laughs> went to Sydney and went to Coona Barabran, which I don't expect you to know where it is. But it looks exactly like that. He was a boundary rider there. The spirit that brought this people, your, you, your parents or your grandparents to this country will absolutely send people to Mars. 
not just, they've solved the number one problem. It's not air to breathe. It's a network of satellites that deliver the internet. <laughs> He's got his, geez, a scale of ambition. I don't know what you work on. I get to work on, you know, a portal that sells photographs of houses. <laughs> Quite like to be working on something going to Mars. This is my favourite video from the last year. I don't know if you've seen it. You've all got it right. The landing, the landing of the rocket back on the platform. That's pretty cool, but I can land a drone. Didn't look that flash to me, because, I mean, how big is it? It looks like maybe size of a car, something like that. I only just found this photo the other day. <laughs> Holy shit, man, that is a big drone. <laughs> and it landed itself. Somebody wrote the code for that. That's cool, that's amazing engineering, because that is the most gigantic thing I ever saw. This is the world I've lived through. I'm not 30,000 years old, but I am 52 years old, and I do genuinely take pride in the fact that you know, I've got a bunch of 36-year-olds, and all of them come heading towards 40, and they've got the kids, and they've got the parents retiring. Mortgage is just a bit too big. They're at this stage in life, and I look in this room, I see the same people, you know? Well, 52, I've reinvented myself three times. I'm only as good as you. I've only worked in the digital economy for the last 15 years. That's it. You've worked in the digital economy for the last 15 years. You're as good as me. Just keep your eyes open. So this is what I've lived. Another era in platforms and media for which you're going to have to develop shit for. And the interesting challenge, you know, in my lifetime, I mean in New Zealand, TV was made in 1936, came to New Zealand in 1970. <laughs> we had PCs. Had one of those. The worldwide, I love this. This is our first website for realestate.com.au. Very cleverly, we called it Virtual Realty. <laughs> Got that one. That's fantastic. Put that URL out because suddenly in 2016, that's incredibly relevant. The worldwide web mobile and VR and AR. Now, the interesting thing that plays out along here is a conversation, right? So I have a 15 year old son, he's my absolute secret weapon in life continually comes down from his bedroom upstairs and utters the foremost hated words in the English language. Not are we there yet, he used to do that when he was eight, but have you heard about? I mean, God, I'm in charge of the resilience of our organisation to technological change, and this 15 year old gets me every three to, oh, have you heard about this? Pinterest just bought Instapaper. Oh, shit. <laughs> and I've learned to deal with that. But across this lifestyle, you know, you get this stuff, and, and, then, and like, what the hell? Facebook bought Oculus? What's their agenda? Then I read Ready Player One, and I figured out their agenda completely. But somewhere on this time, I'm going to tell you a conversation. You have to guess where it is along this line here. So it's a seven-year-old boy and his dad. And his dad's going, you know, we're not getting one of those. We don't need one of those. We've already got something perfectly good in the house. You'll get a headache from it. There's nothing on it anyway. There's no content, Nigel. It's expensive and just another gadget. You don't talk to your brothers enough already, and I'll never get you outside. Now, is that, is that someone talking to their seven-year-old about frickin' HoloLens or the Samsung Gear? There's nothing on it. It'll give you a headache. You won't go outside. You won't talk to your friends. That's my dad talking to me on the phone going, we do not need a television, Nigel. 1970. <laughs> And it was true. New Zealand television didn't start till lunchtime and it finished at 9 o'clock. One channel, black and white, gave you a headache because the resolution was so shit. And whenever I hear that word now, or those words, I go, aha, that's a thing. So that's a thing. Gear VR is a thing. But there's no rule book written about this. I didn't think mobile web was a thing. And I'm part of the team that completely bankrupted Lonely Planet on that basis, basically. You take this out of your pocket with an iPhone 3G. Who remembers how rubbish they were? <laughs> Terrible screen, battery gone by lunchtime, the phone didn't work anyway, and it only worked on, on Wi-Fi to actually browse the web. It was a terrible device. Took it out of pocket and went, there is no chance in the world ever that anybody's going to take a $1,500 computer out of their pocket and walk down Hay Street in Perth looking for a place to find a coffee. They'll be mugged in an instant. Now, walking down Hay Street this morning trying to find a coffee, which is a Herculean task, by the way. Thank God for Bean Hunter and those, those saints who wrote it. I don't think I saw anyone not having a $1,500 computer out of their pocket looking for a place to find coffee. They may have been hunting Pokemon. <laughs> but I'm pretty sure they were looking for a place for coffee, just like me. So it's easy to make those mistakes. 
you know, and in this world, those damn things just keep moving on faster and faster. This is TV as we know it today. I'm guessing not too many people watch the damn thing anymore. That's TV as my 15-year-old knows it. He watches shit on that one. He's got another screen over here and he's got his phone open texting his mates and all this kind of thing. So that's television as we know it now. But that's not television at all. You should, I work in a media company. We're 61% owned by News Corp. So I get to hang out with some cool people. Their, their television company in America is incredible. And working on 3D and VR are so really important to me as a partnership. You know, we sort of think, oh, News Corp. But no, incredible, because the future is about those media. So I've got a big family to draw from. That is not TV at all. That's TV now. Who knew that would happen? Now, you're the first adopters of this. You're all on Twitch watching videos of people who played games two weeks ago, thinking that's cool. Cool, well, it is cool. That's how you learn. By persuading people who are generally 52 years old that television now runs on this device and there's an interactive chat component to it is a bit of a mission. It'll happen, though. So become expert in that. Please all watch Twitch and play games. The other thing I find interesting is, is our ability to cope with exponential change in technology. I had to read three times the article my team sent to me about, because the hardware of this was revealed this week at a conference. There is a CPU in there that is the size of your fingernail that manages one trillion instructions per second. I just go, oh my God, I can't even, I don't, my calculator doesn't even have that many zeros on it. That's remarkable. The secret of this thing is it's an almost entirely a hardware device. Toy Story is something people log into. They come and go, yeah, that was the first time there was a cool animation, right? All the shading and all the stuff. So this is the render farm for Toy Story in 1995. It is an astonishing stack of computers. And God help the poor tech who had to manage the hard drives collection in that. Same power in half of the CPU power of my iPhone 6. In that time, in 20 years... How did that happen that that is replaced by that? It's remarkable. They must have been the most patient IT people in the world rendering a film that size on that farm. And I've just been to Singapore, which is one of the wonderful parts of my job. And this, there's a, I love Singapore. Like, they put things together that we all need to put together, right? So when I went to school, the arts kids went that way, and the science kids went that way, and I had a huge dilemma because I'm going, I like both. But there are not many people who like both. So I go to Singapore, I'm right at home. They have an art science museum. One word, art science. And it's the most remarkable place. It's got the incredible exhibition. This is the thing that struck me most. 2011, an artist printed out every photo that was uploaded to Flickr in 24 hours. <laughs> and, and that's it. There's a million photos in that stack. And I go, oh, bullshit, there's, you know, there's wire, chicken wire under there. So I dug in. You're allowed to. Shit, there's a million photos printed there. That was sponsored by Kodak. <laughs> How long now on Instagram does it take a million photos to be uploaded? What do you reckon? An hour? A couple of hours? Three minutes. There's 15 minutes. 15 minutes for a million photos. We didn't envisage that was going to happen. I thought Flickr was cool. Didn't realise they were owned by Yahoo. <laughs> now, I don't necessarily think that's cool, but it is kind of cool, because they're doing a million kilometers a month in America in, in Google Design Cars, but why are Google and cars is a question I get regularly. I don't know if you've ever thought through the answer on why that is. It's relatively simple. you just got to think like a bastard. <laughs> 5.7 billion hours a year spent driving cars in America. If you weren't driving cars, what are those Americans going to do? To get this device out and get on YouTube. <laughs> Revenue! When? You're going to get on social media, you're going to watch TV, you're going to chat, you're going to do all the things that generate media revenue. That's probably the greatest release of media time in the last 20 years. Brilliant idea, and no wonder they're putting so much effort into it. Because, I mean, I love this. I just had to put this in because I loved it. It's like when I, you know, we first had Google come out, right? It was really bloody obvious when something was an ad. It was down the right-hand side in your Gmail or in the top of the thing. It looked like a really crap link compared to the cool links below, right? Look at the evolution of link design through to the current day. So I know where this is going. You know, it's a walled garden factor that both Facebook and Google are after. That is exactly the same UX and UI as an ordinary piece of content on Google. 
So it didn't take long, and I can tell exactly where they're going from there, which is a little bit nerve-wracking for me, because I, you know, in terms of competitors in the real estate market, I used to think we, you know, we got to spar with domain a bit. That's cool. We're bigger than them. We're doing all right. You know, shit. Actually, they got that power. Maybe Google's my competitor. Why did they build AlphaGo? What do you reckon? Is it because I'm? You all want it in your st Christmas stocking this year, a device about this big that can play Go. I would not expect far too many you know, Go players, any Go players in the room. I can tell you the IQ of those two human beings is not actually normal. <laughs> <laughs> because it's a really complicated game. I struggle to even lay the pieces out. <laughs> Why'd they do that? Well, it's quite simple. The brain power that it took to beat Lee Sedol 4-1 in that tournament, I mean, this is a lot, a lot of when, did it, when did Big Blue beat Kasparov? Do you remember? No, 98, I thought it was. Might have been, but late 90s, we'll say. And at that time, the New York Times published a headline saying, okay, well, these computer nerds have done it. They've beaten the guy at chess, but it's not that complicated. It will take a century for anyone to build a computer that can beat a human being at the game of Go. Good luck. Well, they had to revise that headline. <laughs> Not a century at all, less than 20 years. And I love about that because all of that technology is going one place. It is not going into Go, Go consoles for the two out of 200 human beings who can actually play the game in this room. It's going into your mobile phone. And then your mobile phone is going into your self-driving car. And then you're going to talk to it. And it's all going to come together in this kind of mad cloud of scary shit because all your data is flying all over the place. But it's very, very clever doing a go thing like that. It's, and the world's probably, you've probably all seen this video, this kind of thing of what the world looks like in invented reality. Now, we've got a hint of that in this kind of thing. You know, every so often it pops up with the classic, you need to upgrade Windows 10 message. <laughs> <coughs> and when you're not driving your car and your windows are all augmented reality screens, you'll get the same message for system updates required, but it really <laughs> does enrich the world. Bloody easy to get Pokemon when, you, when your car's driving down. Go! Like that. <laughs> so, this is what we believe. This is how we cope. We go back. This is not the guy I made the coffee for this morning that I wrote a good review of Bean Hunter for. Looks a bit like him. Actually, lived 150 years ago. So, it's Charles Darwin. He wrote a book called On the Origin of Species. It is the most agile book ever written. This guy, he was a great businessman, right? This is a brand new field. He rewrote the book five times, five editions, every time taking in what conversation had heard in what was social media of the day, which were town hall meetings and various other things, and rewrote it. At one stage, another journalist called Herbert Spencer reviewed his book. He said, you don't need to read this one. It's just survival of the fittest. So he didn't actually invent that phrase, even though it's widely associated with Darwin. Darwin liked it. What else did Herbert the pop quiz? What else did Herbert Spencer invent? The paper clip. <laughs> so, whoa, Microsoft, Clippy, Herbert Spencer, shit, join those dots. <laughs> anyway, <coughs> the problem with survival of the fittest is it sounds like, you see how I've translated that for you? It's not survival of the fittest. <laughs> survival of the fittest, I've learned to do that. <laughs> the problem with that is it thinks like, oh, it's the biggest, the strongest, the fastest, the biggest teeth. The most resources, the highest market cap on the Australian Stock Exchange. And we woke up about three years ago going, shit, that's what we're all about. We're about being number one and the biggest and the fastest and the richest and the strongest. Ah, uh, hold it. Charles Darwin said they're the ones least likely to survive. The things that survive and have resilience, which we all want for our organisations in particular, we want jobs in 10 years' time, is to be responsive to change. And being responsive to change requires a whole new mindset entirely. This is what happens when you're not. Uh, I don't know if any of you have been to San Francisco in recent times. I used to show this slide in, Jan in December last year, basically, and I'd say to people, look, go there, ride in the yellow cab, because you'll tell your grandchildren about it. <laughs> oh, they're not going to believe you. You're going to go, yeah, well, these yellow cabs, these shitty old cars, they used to drive down the street like this, and they slow down when they see you. They try to catch you in the eye. <laughs> Have you ever experienced that? You know your grandkids are going to say, oh, you mean like stalking? <laughs> what? They're too poor to have an iPhone? Or whatever it is in 2035? 
It's just madness, isn't it? What a crazy business model. Now, they used to do 1,400 trips a month. They now do 400. And in January, they filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. You can get an Uber and a Lyft from Oakland Airport in San Francisco. And you, you're not going to get about a four-minute wait for an Uber from, um, from San Francisco. So, shit, it's gone. We thought it was there forever, but it's gone. The unintended consequences are things I'm always interested in. That's where the social scientist in me comes out. So I always ask Uber drivers how they got to be an Uber driver. It's a fascinating question. These are the people at the leading edge of change in our economy because they are willing to be criminals to try something different. Now, we just legalized Uber in Victoria. Somehow we ended up paying a $2 tax for every trip to the dinosaur industry, but that's okay. I asked this bloke one day, he took me in this particularly nice car. He said, well, how did you become an Uber driver? He said, I'm not really an Uber driver. I'm actually an Uber teacher. I started a school. I'm going, what? Like, people know how to drive. It's like, come on. He's going, no, no, no. 5,000 Uber drivers in Melbourne. Every week, 200 drop out. Because if their score that you've rated them on goes below to 4.6, the app goes blank. And it's report to Uber headquarters in Cremorne. Two weeks to get you enrolled in the school, improve your act, pass the exam, and you get 30 drives to ensure you're above 4.59 stars out of five. Okay, holy shit, that's a level of transparency we're not really used to out here in the real world. Like, who ends up in your school? He says, 75% of the people in my school used to have one job. What was it? Taxi driver. And this is one of our problems, is the inertia caused by kind of learned incapacity. Taxi drivers have no reason to think that you have to talk to the passenger or keep your car clean. Because for 50 years they haven't bothered. For 20 years they have not replaced the fucking suspension in their cars. <laughs> Which makes me ill in every taxi I get into. Anyway, so he's built a brilliant new business out of an opportunity that didn't even exist two years ago. That's what I love, is that curiosity and invention along the way creates new opportunities. So we shouldn't fear too much of its change. But, um, anyway, he's making good money from that. The other 200 drivers. There is a flip side to it, though, because you've got a rating as well. Who knows the Uber, their own Uber rating? You've got an Uber over here? Well, what's your score out of five stars? 4.7. Cool. What did you do wrong? <laughs> I'm 4.89, I have the natural human reaction. Who's the asshole who rated me down? I'm a nice guy, I ask you what you're doing. How did you not score me a five? But I'm, you know, that's life, I'm cool with that. Now, there's more tolerance for misbehavior from consumers than there is from drivers. So the score at which Ubers start disappearing off your screen and nobody picks you up is 4.2. So watch yourself, if you soil a cab or racially abuse a driver, you do that at taxis all the time, don't you? Because they're racially abusing you back. It's fair. <laughs> do that at an Uber, you're done. What's going to happen then? It's like you're not going to get picked up. You sit outside a hotel with an American woman. Outside that hotel, she's going, oh, this country's this is just terrible. There's no Ubers. <laughs> and I look at that screen going, shit, she's right. It's like, there's nothing. One within 10 minutes. So I whip mine out because I need to get home as well. Six cars within two minutes. <laughs> oh. <coughs> One of you coded that, probably. I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of hyped. No, no, you're right. There's no Ubers. I'll just go over here. <laughs> <laughs> and what happens in that world where you no longer, you know, like, you no longer, uh, and all the yellow cabs are gone. They've all gone bankrupt. I don't know, we've got public transport, at least in Melbourne. There's going to be a lot of walking goes on. Or secret opportunity, out of an unintended consequence, the yellow cab of shame. <laughs> and you know what? We solve those basic problems of racial abuse and soiling cabs because it's that dumbass white car that Google made. It's looking like a bucket upside down, plastic on the inside. You just hose the vomit out. It's all good after the footy. Recycle that thing in five minutes. And there's no driver to abuse. So unintended consequences. Always think them through. Thank Christ, nobody from Uber is interested in real estate. <laughs> oh shit, two weeks ago, like two weeks ago on Monday, one of the founders of Uber decided real estate was next. <laughs> Launched a company called House. Now, there's, I think he's got it wrong. He's made a classic error of business people. I'm, I'm not understanding the difference between a complex problem domain 
and an obvious or simple problem to match. Some of you may know the Kinefin framework. You know, simple problems, you just buy a piece of software or do what you did last time. Complex problems, it's an ecosystem problem, everything's connected to everything, and woe betide you if you try to simplify it by buying SAP. <laughs> because you just find you press that button like an octopus in a string shopping bag. And real estate is one of those problems which what clearly attracts me to it. I just love the ecosystem. So I think he's messed it up. It's exactly the same system, complete transparency of the transaction of the people doing it. Now, Airbnb is an interesting company for me because I stay in Airbnbs, right? They've got a brilliant story they tell. First of all, God, it's founded by designers. Their site looks brilliant, you know? The user interface is astonishing. And um, I wish mine looked a bit like that. It works really well. Now, the trick is everyone thinks they're the heroes of the mums and dads. In America, where I lived for four and a half years, I thought you freak out about medical costs and tuition costs for your kids and all that. Let alone taking a holiday and your five days vacation each year. But you worry about that stuff, so having your front room to rent would be great, right? You get a little bit of extra cash to buy things and cover your insurance costs. But the trouble is it's, that's not really the truth about Airbnb. And if you look at airbnb.com.au forward slash sublet, S-U-B-L-E-T, they've launched a property management service. So it is longer leases, six and 12 months. This is what it looks like in the area I, I live in. Plenty of properties for lease. And this is happening big time. Did you know that Australia has the highest penetration in a single suburb of Airbnb listed properties? It's Tamarama. That's taken me a month to learn to say that word properly. It's not Tamarama. Tamarama, 20% of the entire housing stock in that suburb is listed on Airbnb. And here's the myth busted, right? It's not mums and dads leasing out that front room. It's people leasing a whole house out on a longer term basis as well. So it changed, the story doesn't change, it's not obvious to everyone, so I encourage you to always look underneath the problem. And then you can download this app if you want to and become an Airbnb property manager. Now, you can manage a dozen properties using this, it's actually a pretty brilliant platform. It's woken me up to go, shit, while I'm playing with hollow lenses, I need to build an app real quick for property managers because they are the angriest people in Australia because of the lack of transparency of the people they have to deal with continuously checking references. They're stressed, they're, they're, they're worried, and then I go and tell them that half their properties have been re-leased re and arbitraged on Airbnb, they get even more stressed. <laughs> but they can walk away from that business and we'll pick up this app and go and start their own property management business, which would be cool, except for one little economic factor about the property world you probably didn't know. If I'm 65 years old, and I'm thinking about retiring to Portsea or Fremantle or selling my real estate agency, how do you reckon the price of my real estate agency is established? You know, in the same way your startups or your companies, whatever you've got, is well, future revenue multiple of, all those kind of things. Which component of real estate revenue is the future value of your agency valued on? It isn't how many hotshot salespeople you have selling houses at auctions or selling houses at the weekend. It's how big is your what they call rent roll. How much money do you get from managing rental properties? Because it's repeatable, stable income, and those people don't leave and go to the next agency every you know, th every three years or so. So you've got Airbnb on now, eating away at the rental income of these agencies. So I'm 65 years old watching the value of my business get eaten by an American company. People borrow money against the multiple of their rent roll as the valuation of their business. Highly indebted on this basis because they're ambitious and buying up other agencies. So this is actually sort of one of those bizarre crises that come to an industry that you've got to keep your eyes open for. But don't worry about them. What did William, what's William Gibson's most famous quote from like, like me? The future is already here. It's just really unevenly distributed. Great quote, hot use at the moment. Really unevenly distributed in real estate means Kalgoorlie. <laughs> I mean, the people in this room don't even know where fucking Kalgoorlie is. <laughs> I'm finding it on a map. You know what's going on there? It's because the future is already here, and the future is Facebook. This is my competitor, and they've got 15,000 hotshot engineers, right? Property is now being sold and leased in a thing called buy-sell swap groups. They've accidentally found on one of the key factors of the real estate industry is that it all works in neighborhoods. Human beings belong to tribes who live in neighborhoods. People don't often move much beyond their neighborhoods. And here it is, for all your real estate needs, the Kalgoorlie Boulder Real Estate Buy Sell Rent to Let, they need a little bit of marketing help on the title. It's got as many rental properties as realestate.com.au, and I just deployed 
a person in the account manager out there, because this is the front line of the war between Australian companies and American companies, Kalgoorlie. <laughs> <laughs> Who'd have thought? But that's a fantastic thing. That's a global player managing to play locally. We need to think locally and start, you know, which is kind of how we started. We've got a little a side in Australia, but we've got one in America, we've got one in Italy, one in Luxembourg, all those places. We need to think the opposite way around, because I think humans start local. You can buy all sorts of shit on buy, sell, swap groups. This is the Chadston one, a $50,000 holding Commodore for sale. Well, hold it a minute, buy, sell, swap groups were just for baby clothes. 10 bucks through the door, you know, if they don't pay it, you slam them and flame them on, on Facebook. What's the worst that could happen? The only other business model in the world where the goods stay on the front step and you put 10 bucks through the door is what? Drug dealing. <laughs> <laughs> the retribution puts you off, you know, misleading everyone. $50,000 Commodore on a site that used to sell $10 boxes of baby clothes. We just recently invested in a business with, uh, with News Corp or News Corp owner. We just kind of linked within our family around home repairs. Because not everybody's got a network of plumbers, you know. So a lot of people moved to Melbourne like me. I don't have my plumber tradey network at my fingertips. So High Pages is a great service for sorting that out. Transparency, ratings, trustworthiness, all those kind of things. Paid several million dollars for this, did my friends at News Corp. And here's the competition. It's a buy, sell, swap group. Deb, I need a handyman to realign a lock on my door. I can offer some bottles of wine, seedlings of carrot, spinach, and lettuce. <laughs> They're hippies out west, I can tell you. But look at this. My pension doesn't go far enough to cover the $100 call-out fee plus labor. What's high pages basic business model? You've probably got the same business model several companies in here. As we take 20 bucks out of that 100 bucks for making the link in the ecosystem. Let's see what happens next. Rob says, I'm working in Newport today. If you're close, I'll drop in. No call-out fees. We're old school. Well, fuck you, Rob. That's my business model in the chicken there. <laughs> and then, like every ecosystem, Rob's in trouble because, Matt, where, where are you, Deb? I'll pop in and fix it for free. <laughs> the devil's own idea. <laughs> A neighbour. And that's what you do, didn't you? We've always done that. Neighbourhoods, neighbours. I kind of love it and I hate it. It's like, oh, because then Dave comes and says, I'm also willing to help out for free. And Deb, who is a pensioner, who I do have sympathy for, does a trade on a neighbourhood basis like she would have done a hundred years ago. <coughs> you can buy ads on Facebook. There's a mobile section called Property Within Local Markets. That's fantastic. They just, you, one of you probably wrote the bot that presents this. This looks just like a property portal. There I was. It just, present, you know, it just goes through your network, your friends of friends and your geography and finds a whole bunch of things that look like property with a price on it, whether it's rent, house share or sale, pops it into that. Click on that, you can look at the details. Click on that, you can look at the agency. It's Jose from Fairy Boss Real Estate. Gigantic customer of mine. Not a customer at all. Just a bloke. I mean, in, in California, because they get into a bit of trouble for not paying taxes, right? That is a bit of a problem. Our dilemma with fighting startups is that they are ideas searching for a business model. And they have a gigantic amounts of cash with which to find that business model. How much money do you reckon Uber made last year? They lost 570 billion in the first half. Million in the first half. It probably could be billion, but million. And they got you know, three billion in cash just sitting there to be burned, getting through the legal dilemmas of being a criminal organization. <laughs> Doing marketing, hiring drivers, and figuring out the business models until they crush the taxi industry. What are they doing in food? Food delivery. That's insane. Anyway, he's the face of the future. In Los Angeles, the government asked them very specifically, what proportion of your income comes from mums and dads with the front room to rent so your kids can go to college? And what proportion of your income comes from professional property managers using your website as a platform for not working at a real estate agency? What do you reckon the split is? Because two thirds of the listing on Airbnb are mums and dads. Remember my quote, the future is already here. It's just really unevenly distributed. In San Francisco, the ratio is 25% of their income comes from professional property managers. They know not to shit in their own backyard because the authorities there are angry about hotel taxes and various other things. Los Angeles, that's miles away. 89% of their income comes from property managers managing multiple properties. It's one of those things, get your eyes open. It's already gone. 
somebody already used Martian thinking to go, oh, the rules are off, what would you do? That's what you'd do. You have to think the same way. You know, in a world where this bloke, you could persuade a thousand people to put a headset on and watch him come into a stadium to talk to the, you know, the thing is fantastic, it's Mark Zuckerberg, my remote control, my head, oh, do you think take it off? He's standing there himself. <laughs> but that's way cooler to do. This isn't going to happen. <laughs> but, you know, people get kind of put off and, and a bit yucked about the whole VR thing because they think that's going to happen. The only way that'll happen is that there's some kind of foam pad on the front so when he gets punched between the eyes by a partner, <laughs> it doesn't hurt too much. But this has happened. So that's Facebook, that's all the others. This is it, this is Google. So at South by Southwest, of all places to go discovering your competition, two of us went to South by Southwest. I only went because I knew they were going to have some cool VR stuff. And this company called 10X was the head of the show. They launched holographic real estate agents. Now they just used the old cheating fellows in Dr. Dre or Jay-Z or whoever's the dead rapper that appeared on the glass shield, and that's kind of cool. But I'll tell you what, nothing frightens real estate agents than being replaced by a robot. A digital robot's even scarier, right? So this is Google, 10X, they call it a great brand, global brand for selling real estate. Well, Christ, so now I've got Kalgoorlie, Facebook, I've got these guys coming in under 10X, so they built it on the basis of buying a shitbox company called Auction.com that removed the agent from the model. And that was pretty clever because they sold $30 billion of property like that. That's why we're in America, because there's more people Bayside than there are in Australia. It's a brilliant market to be part of, but it is a complex domain. So you have to have that mindset of understanding how to do that. Now, they're already taking pictures of almost every business in Melbourne that's called Business View. That's inside of a restaurant. These blokes I don't worry about, gum tree. It's just two guys in the Flinders Rangers with a kangaroo and a floppy hat and corks falling off it, drinking a Forex or any drink on this side of the world. I had to actually cut and paste components out of Gumtree to make it look like a website. The UX is that shit. Like, what's the golden rule of Gumtree? Everything on Gumtree is stolen. <laughs> Even the houses. So we all ignore it and laugh and go, and I use buy, sell, swap groups. Gumtree's so last Thursday. The trick is there's 67,000 property listings on Gumtree. And who actually owns it? Is it two blokes with the floppy hat and the kangaroo? eBay owns it. It's their deliberate strategy. It's their business strategy. eBay high end, free to list, Gumtree, make a bit of money along the way. In Australia, it's actually illegal for me to collaborate too closely with car sales and seek because they don't want that monopoly position emerging again that the media had in the 90s. Have a look at their agenda. Cars and vehicles, jobs and real estate. Interesting. How much tax did they pay in Australia last year? Not a lot. You, you would have all done it. We've got geofilters on Snapchat putting invisible lines around open for inspections that they don't own, that are non-existent, and they probably have no right to sell. Kids step over the line, bam, take a photo, they've got a Snapchat frame advertising the real estate agent. Shit, again. It's, a, it's a, an idea, a, a product idea looking for a business model. They will do anything. Banking, whatever it takes. Snapchat will be peer-to-peer -peer lending. You won't, you won't be sending your sister a six-second shot of your ass. You'll be sending her 50 bucks. Why not? Peer-to-peer -peer platform. Ad blocking's an interesting competitor for us. Didn't see that one coming. Shit. We're an ad business. We reckon, oh, we're lucky. We've got to skew to a slightly older demographic, so maybe 8 to 10% of our users have an ad blocker, but the day that an ad blocker works as an app on your phone and blocks ads in every single other app, which one of you clever bastards wrote that? Because <laughs> it's a pretty cool piece of code, I tell you. Now, I go to a different population like my 300 engineers, like 70% of them have an ad blocker on. They just think that's normal. They get confused when somebody um, slacks, oh my god, have you seen the ad on, on the home page? They're going, shit, we have heads on our site. <laughs> <laughs> now that's a freakish kind of third statistical deviation away from the real world, but this is going to be a big problem. But it's actually, it's about what you do next that's clever. It's about owning that relationship with that consumer. Permission-based marketing, all those kind of things. So take that as a challenge. It's not a threat. 
Pixar will jump over, but everyone now has got a mobile app with the value of every property in Australia on it, right? So this is an interesting point. We're a pretty successful large company, but the technology-led competition is at an unprecedented rate. What have we done? We got involved in 3D tours. That was cool. That was early technology with a company called Matterport. Just a hypothesis. Let's just give it a crack, put it on the site, hacked it in. Holy shit, the engagement factor from people being self-powered in a walk through a house off the planet. We start tapping into the psychology of consumers, which is an incredibly important thing to do. So we bought the company. So actually we didn't. This is a joy of being part of the News Corp group. They wrote the check and have now a, a part of the Matterport company, which is fantastic because the pipeline to me of their beta software is going to give me an incredible advantage. And if you get a moment, I've brought what we've done with their beta software in turning 3D tours into actual uh, stereoscopic walkthroughs. This is our very first portal around making a, what our portal looked like. This is the one that made the lady sick <laughs> and sent the other one off to the hospital. And, and she absolutely stunned us. Like it was a, we were stone cold dead. She says, I think you find that my couch doesn't swivel. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't think of that. So, again, really interesting engineering challenge, and all credit to my crew. You've got a really inventive mindset going back, okay, well, that's a constraint. What should we do? Because, no, your couch doesn't swivel. You can't look at properties at home on the couch while you're watching The Biggest Loser. <laughs> a, because The Biggest Loser is no longer visible. You put a headset on, and B, your couch doesn't swivel. A lot of consumer testing. Look at the average age of the people working on my uh, VR and AR. It's a lot younger, I can tell you that. They love getting out there and talking to people and figuring out how it works. They invented something to do that. And this is what they came up with. Is, 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 this was the first design. Oh, my God. You've got, like, a robotic laser beam to figure out how to, how to, how to select it. You think, ugh, ugh, on one bedroom. Three go. No, you can't do that. That's bullshit. But you do have a tap on here and then... That's what they invented. Sleek, and that's a bit funny. You've got to kind of move it to the left like that. But that's what they came up with. Currently looks a bit like that, and I've got a version of the headset to brag about. This is our augmented reality adventure beginning. A bunch of Kiwis came in with their idea. They'd built for a pizza company in New Zealand. You can see Luke, my chief engineer around uh, the invention side, is going, yeah, this is shit. <laughs> and they are, come on, they'll never take off. So you can imagine how I paid off on Luke Chadwick over Pokemon Go. <laughs> yes! Because <laughs> AR's mainstream now. People expect it on their phone. They know to look for stuff. So, fantastic. That's a company called Platter. And uh, again, wonderful thing of being part of a big family with a big checkbook. News Corp bought into them. They made this thing with us, which was about paper. You know, oh, nobody reads the paper anymore, Nige. It's the trouble we're hanging out with 300 engineers and none of them do read the paper anymore, but a lot of consumers do. And you watch a two-year-old kid go tap, 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 trying to make the picture bigger. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> Holy cow, <laughs> what if you could do that by getting your phone out and holding it over it? That'd be cool. And then make it hang in the air and make it magic, not just pop to a website. Make it magic. And that's what we did. Turn that into whole neighbourhoods where you've got to imagine that I can only explain to this crew, so it's Lord of the Rings, right? Frodo puts the ring on, and this is wispy white weird layer appears over everything. That's the data in our world. He can hear conversations miles away. He can understand what the spiders say. It's a bit painful to be in there. A bit like augmented reality. Neighbourhoods have data flowing all through them. And if I can put a phone up and tap it, I can find the value of that house. I can see the video of this one. I can see what their plans are. And that's what we tapped into as an idea and went, shit, that's actually something pretty interesting. That's where the HoloLens came in. And, and give you an idea of our place, we have a very multidisciplinary approach to stuff. Diversity is key, diversity of profession, of, of gender and otherwise. So that's my finance manager trying, look, one of the first people, who, probably because she wrote the check, but getting to try out the HoloLens. And then this thing's coming, the Daydream. So Daydream is Google's thing, it'll launch before Christmas. Brilliant, and, and it'll be 50 bucks. Bluetooth controller, none of this stupid stuff. So the leapfrogging of this technology is incredible. They just kind of sat back and waited for HTC to figure that out. This is how my world uh, looks through the eyes of a 15-year-old. He doesn't care what he doesn't even know the name of my suburb is Middle Park, right? What he knows we live in. So this is a map of Sydney, the red zones, high-end bandwidth, yellow zones are not so good, 
white signs only suitable for grandparents. <laughs> <laughs> My problem, I live in a $2 million house in a grandparent zone. <laughs> he views the whole world this way. He didn't give a shit about valuations and local news. He says, I just, I've got like 500 gigs a month on Steam. If I left it on 100% for all 30 days, I still could only download 250. <laughs> and robots. This is kind of a typical view of what robots are like. I love frightening my customers. I'm going to, I'm going to build robots. But that's the inside of our robots that we're working on is if you make them friendly and interactive and use that intelligence, they can become part of the conversation and save time. I have a particular interest in this. My mother has dementia, and I see the life she lives in her dementia care and go, you know what, shit, she really wouldn't matter if it was a robot. <laughs> but it's friendly and it's nice, and the two of the robots are interacting. It's going to be great, because I get the same conversation every time I go and see her. The robot's probably more patient. <laughs> Where's the frightening bits? The frightening bits is this. So quantum computing... <laughs> Gotta quit. That's frightening. That's frightening. 5G. I don't know if any of you understand the implications of, a, of an Australian wide 5G network. That should unleash us where the NBN hasn't. That's my diagram to explain how Bitcoin works and distributed ledgers, which will completely upset the property industry. And this is the lesson. So we invented this word, inventorship. That is, in fact, the spirit we have to do. We have, we have separated invention from innovation. And that's really important because you tell people to innovate and they get worried about customers. Tell them to invent, which is a core talent of a country that came from far around the world to Australia and built shit out of wire and wood and dirt. We're good at inventing. And this room's the inventors. So I absolutely encourage you to engage that spirit in your organization. And we won't all end up in businesses that are headquartered in Silicon Valley. Thank you very much.